So why is it so hard to love our bodies? We have to understand that our culture is set up for us to not love our bodies. And that's got to do with patriarchy and that's got to do with a commercial world where um, companies profit if women hate their bodies because we all spend a fuck ton of money on clothes and hair and makeup and, I don't know, all the other guff that goes into being a woman that doesn't necessarily need for a man to. However, I notice that it is totally creeping into to men now, like men are expected to do more grooming and moisturising than ever. However, when it comes down to it, like it's a really great thing for patriarchy if we are so fixated on how we look and whether we're worthy and our bodies are worthy of allowing to be in the world in the way that they are, that we don't concentrate on the really important things like, you know, the patriarchy (laughs) and financial freedom for ourselves and um, marriage equality and racial equality and ending starvation around the world and taking care of our planet and all those really important things. So we're up against some really fucking hard odds, but I think it's really, really important for us to just to see those <clears throat> those influences for what they are um, and to say, you know what, I'm actually just not going to buy into that. And removing yourself wherever possible from those kinds of influences that would make you hate on your body because that is not the natural order of things. I promise you we were not born hating ourselves. We've been taught to hate ourselves by magazines and media and all of the other shit and we can just elect out of it and say, yeah, nah. (laughs) Also, your friends can really determine your body love because if they have bought into that whole hate on myself, hate how I look, If you've got friends who talk constantly about their weight, about what they can eat, how they look, what's wrong with them, what's wrong with their body, what they need to do next to buy, all those kinds of things, that will influence what you think is normal. Because you are the average of the five people that you spend most of your time with. So you've got to make them good ones. So some handy tips in this lovingly offered to you. First and foremost, I would recommend that you become the light, the self-love light in your team of people, your your tribe, your friendship circle, and say, you know what, I'm actually not going to hate on myself anymore. I'm not going to talk about it, and I'm actually not willing to talk about those things with you. And you can set up some really healthy boundaries that says, you know what, I'm actually, you can't talk to me about how you hate yourself. Um, I'm not I'm not interested I'm not here for that Um, because let's talk about more interesting things with our lives there's so many wonderful other things that you can speak about Um, and also really be on the lookout for other self-love adoring people and spend more time around them so that you can acclimate to a deeper level of love within yourself so One of the people who has influenced me most about body love and self-love is one of my dear friends and spiritual mentors, Deborah Namara. I met her when I was about 21 and I remember the experience of meeting her because I was a brand new public servant and trying very hard to fit in. Uh, and I walked into a lift filled with public servant people and um, all of these men in suits and Deb was in the middle of this elevator and she had purple hair and she was bodacious and curvy and she just radiated life and succulence and she said to this lift full of strangers she said oh god my ovaries are really aching today my uterus is really bloated (laughs) and I loved so profoundly how she totally was her own self totally was in reclamation of her own womanhood and would not change who she was no matter 
who she was around. Like, here we go. I'm going to talk about woman bits. And I hadn't heard of somebody speak about their woman bits like that before. Like, it was kind of like this thing you did not speak of. You know, like we all know that they're there, but they're almost dirty words to say uterus or <laughs> good Lord, if we ever said vagina. And Deb was just out and proud in love with her body and herself um, and authentic in that process wherever, you know, wherever she was, whether she was at work, surrounded by suits or in sacred women's circles, which is what she introduced me to. And I also wanted to say, like, Deb was and is profoundly loved. The way that she goes into places and is fully herself, um, it, it would be hard to find a more cherished person on the planet by people of all walks of life because when somebody is themselves, they give other people permission to be themselves as well. And that's a real breath of fresh air. So she introduced me into sacred women's circles and I got to meet other women just like her who also were saying a big nah to, you know, the the traditional normal paradigm of what it was to be a woman and what it means to be a good woman and who were authentic and spiritual and honouring of themselves who could speak their truth and um, be heard and lovingly accepted by their circle of, of women sisters. So I'm very lucky to have had somebody who so deep who showed me what it was to be a woman by embodying it herself. And my hope and prayer is that you find people like Deb in your life, you seek them out and you become them yourself. And if I can be that purple haired chick in a lift for you in some small way, speaking about my uterus, then my destiny is complete. <laughs> now, when I was thinking about the important things I wanted to share about, you know, body love course, there was two sacred texts which I felt like needed to be shared. And I usually don't share quotes in courses like this. But this was, you know, too good not to and so perfectly in tune and so my mantra as well for when I think about self-love and body love. Sometimes I shave my legs and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I comb my hair and sometimes I won't. It depends on how the wind blows. I might even paint my toes. It really just depends on whatever feels good in my soul. I'm not the average girl from your video, and I ain't built like a supermodel, but I learned to love myself unconditionally because I am a queen. I'm not the average girl from your video. My worth is not determined by the price of my clothes. No matter what I'm wearing, I will always be India Ari. When I look in the mirror and the only one there is me, every freckle on my face is where it's supposed to be. And I know my creator didn't make no mistakes on me. My feet, my thighs, my lips, my eyes, I'm loving what I see. And I feel like this is a particularly important paragraph, so I'm going to repeat it. Let it really sink in. You can also enjoy the sweet sound of my dog, Angel, who is using this opportunity to celebrate her own self-love of voice. <laughs> when I look in the mirror and the only one there is me, every freckle on my face is where it's supposed to be. And I know my creator didn't make no mistakes on me. My feet, my thighs, my lips, my eyes, I'm loving what I see. And of course, that is a song by the luminescent India Ari. 
If you haven't already, I would highly recommend that you go out and buy all of her albums now because she is such a warrior and priestess and teacher of self-love through her lyrics. Plus, she's just a rad chick, really. So when I read, when I listened to those lyrics for the first time about 10 years ago, they became like a sacred mantra for me because it really points to the truth about this. Every freckle on my face is where it's supposed to be. I know my creator didn't make no mistakes on me. And so when I look at myself in the mirror and when I look at my body, I think every freckle on my face is where it's supposed to be. And every mole that I have is like a kiss from God. It's being placed there. And if I argue against that, then I am arguing with the creator of this universe, with how things are supposed to be. And I don't care what religion you are. I think we can all believe in and trust in that we were born to be exactly what we are. And that it's a miracle to be alive. It's a miracle miracle to be on this planet. And I don't think we can scrutinize that miracle and point out what we think are its flaws because there's some really fucking dumb flaws <laughs> they're cultural priests like concepts and instead like how refreshing is it just to say every part of me was put here for a reason and to argue against that is to argue against the miracle of life to argue against the wisdom of this universe. So we can all just, if you want, I feel like it's a good idea. Trust that every freckle on your face is where it's supposed to be. So have I always loved my body? The answer is, of course, yes and no. So... I've always been a bit of a weirdo in lots of ways in that I didn't feel particularly comfortable socially when I was a kid. I didn't really felt like I belonged to the world of people and it was easier for me to be friends with animals and my art than it was to be friends with humans and I I got picked on a lot at school but I didn't let it really affect my self-worth because I had a really strong sense of what was true and what was not true and so I knew that I was okay that I was more than okay, I was perfect just as I was, that I was loved and that I also loved myself. I don't think we need to learn to love ourselves. Like I think we, we, we are born loving ourselves. And instead for many of us it's just remembering that and letting go of any idea, any bullshit that tells you you can't love yourself. Like, well, that's bullshit. And here's a really, really simple way to work out whether something is true or not. If it lights up your cells, it is truth. And if it does not, it is not. So if somebody says, you are shit, you suck, you should be different. How does that make your cells feel? If it diminishes them, which it will because it's bullshit, then you know that it's not true. When somebody says, you know, I see in you. I believe in you. I love you. You are good and you are holy just as you are. 
no idea that's the truth. And other people can be confused and other people can say things, but it doesn't make it in it doesn't make it true. And so while there were a lot of circumstances in my childhood, both at school and in my family, which were pretty bonkers and didn't tell me that the truth, somehow I just knew that it was bullshit. And I didn't really put too much stock into it, you know. And I knew that one day I'd be able to grow up and leave the house and leave school and surround myself with really cool people. (laughs) And that I was just going to keep having fun anyway. And in fact, I remember um, when I was a teenager, I remember in my high school, there was a girl, another girl that was being picked on by one particular girl and I turned to the girl that was doing the picking and I said to her, do you, do you love yourself? Because I, I saw really clearly, if you love yourself, you don't pick on other people. You don't hurt other people because there's no need to. The only people that cause harm are the ones that have hurt and sadness and unlove inside them. So I said, do you love yourself? And she said, oh, God, what are you talking about? Of course I don't love myself. Like, are you, like, in love your, in love with yourself or something? I said, yeah. Yeah, I am. <laughs> and, of course, she looked at me like I was a complete fucking freak. But it's true. When you are alive and in love with yourself, you, you don't have to cause hurt to others. So I remember when I was a teenager, I finally decided, you know what? I think I should learn how to be a woman. You know, I'd kind of blissfully zipped along in my own little happy world of books and animals and art. And I just remember that decision. I am going to learn how to be a woman. Enough of this child stuff. I need to know what it is to be a woman. And so I bought a magazine. I think it was like Dolly magazine or something like that. And I remember reading through it. And, um, you know, I talked a lot about thighs. And at that point, I would have been about 14 at that point, I was um, very muscular um, because I lived on a farm. At that stage, I was, you know, I could lift two, two tons of hay bales, like hay squares in a day. Um, you know, I worked, I worked hard on the farm and my body was strong and, and lithe. And I looked at the pictures of the models in there who were really skinny. And I realized like, there's no way that my body's ever going to look like that. Like, I'm at peak fitness <laughs> at that point. Like, I'm, I'm not at peak fitness now because I don't need to lift fucking two tons of hay a day. <laughs> um, but I knew then that my body was never going to look like a model's. And I remember looking at pictures of thighs in the magazine because it's so preoccupied with thighs and looking at my own thighs and clutching it with the hands thinking, God, it appears like I have a whole like more handful of thigh here than is supposed to be here. However, I don't like it's not like I can carve it off. And again, peak fitness. This is this is an unwinnable thing. Like if I am trying to attempt a body that I am not born as, like I am I'm an Amazon. I'm, you know, like I'm built like a swimmer, not as fit as a swimmer now, but um, like I'm, I'm, I'm a sturdy creature <laughs> and I, you know, a square isn't going to fit into a, a circular hole. So it's probably going to be a bit of a waste of time to 
be looking at people's bodies that are genetically completely different to mine. So that was a really good decision from a 14-year-old's behalf. And then I thought to myself, well, there's a beauty checklist here and it says that I'm supposed to do this beauty routine once a week. Right, well, I'll give that a go because that's what it's, um, you know, what it is to be a woman. <laughs> and I remember this Saturday holding myself up in the bathroom and I had to shampoo and um, then deep, deep moisturize my hair and then put a mask on my face and it was just this goopy, horrific shit and I had to exfoliate and shave my my armpits and my legs and then I had to do give myself a pedicure and a manicure and this went on for motherfucking hours. Like this was a long ass checklist of things I was supposed to do every single week. The sun set and I thought Sweet Jesus, I have spent the whole afternoon in the bathroom and I'm supposed to do this every fucking week in order to be a woman? What a waste of fucking time. What a complete waste of time. I don't look any different. I didn't need to look any different. I could have spent that time being on my horse. I could have spent that time with my dog. I could have read a book. I could have napped in the sunlight. Like if I wasn't working that day on the farm, then fuck me. I should have been doing something I actually enjoyed doing. <laughs> I could have been writing stories, goddammit. And so just at that point, I thought, well, this is actually like a really inappropriate allocation of my time resources. And so um, I'm just, I don't think I'll just skip. I think I'll skip doing this whole beauty routine thing that apparently women do because I don't see the point in it and men don't have to do it. And I don't, I have to do it either because there's no fucking point. So I skipped out. I opted out of the whole beauty routine or thinking that my body should look any different from what it was. And that was a really fucking good decision as a 14-year-old. And I haven't really gone back on it since then. I also grew up in a, probably an atypical household in a lot of ways. My brother was born, my eldest brother, Clinton, was born with cerebral palsy. This is him with a bunch of his mates um, at a sports championship um, awards evening. And he is one second from the left. Um, and um, my mother was a disability support worker while I was a kid as well. And so we would have lots of clients um, in and out of the house with different disabilities. My two sisters went on to do disability support work as well for a long while. So we grew up in a body diverse household. And so really quickly, quickly you realize that bodies are born in all different shapes, sizes, and abilities, and it doesn't really fucking matter. And really what's important is enjoy yourself, basically. So my brother Clinton and all of his friends, um, who are some of the most joyful people I've ever met, um, they really taught me what it was to be a human and how to have the most amount of fun, no matter how your body is. My brother loved sports. He would often joke that he wished he was more disabled so he could compete in more sports. Um, he was number two in Australia for high jump. He was going to be in the Sydney 2000 Paralympics but um, died of a farm accident beforehand. And um, <laughs> the best, some of the best experiences, most formative experiences of my teenage years are going to disability support uh, di disability sport days because it's never about winning and it's all about just participating and you will see people who are struggling to even finish 50 meters and they are being cheered on and their friends are going back to help them across the line and they get the bigger um, round of applause and it's the greatest thing on earth to go to um, <laughs> a one of their celebration nights because if you can learn to dance or even just remember to dance, um, 
at an evening with people who are filled with all kinds of um, different abilities, um, mentally and physically, they will teach you what dance is really about. And it's not about how good you look. It's not about how cool you look. It is about moving your body in a way that makes you have fun. And you have not lived, I say, until you have danced with 100 people with disabilities um, on <laughs> a dance floor, um, living life out loud. So I was very lucky to learn about body love from my dear brother who has cerebral palsy and his friends who had all different kinds of conditions and were also the, some of the greatest spiritual teachers of my life. <laughs>